Every one of us wants to be a better person. You ask people of all backgrounds, men, women, children, people of faith, of no faith, different races, different cultures, there is no individual on earth that is not striving in some way to improve their character, their personality. It's just that we can be lax at times or lazy or just get trapped in our routines. The question is, how do you actually become a better person, a better you? Now, some of us say, I'd love that to happen, but it's just something that's genetic. I'm wired a certain way. I'm wired to be angry. I'm wired to be a pleaser. I'm wired to um, be too disciplinarian. I'm too weak, too much fear. Some won't say it's wiring in DNA. Others say it's due to life circumstances, habits, patterns, my childhood, dysfunctionality, abuse, violation. And not that we're looking for excuses. It's just that the fact is that each of us is a product of many different circumstances. So like always, everything is in the details. When someone says, I want to make a resolution to be a better person, be specific. How are you going to do that? Are you going to volunteer? Are you going to show some kindness to a stranger? Are you going to help a special child? Are you going to work on a certain aspect of yourself? A number of years ago, I received a call from Salt Lake City, a psychiatrist who ran a rehab center. He was the head of a rehab center for drug and alcohol survivors. And he said to me, you have a book called The Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer. And it's the best book I've ever found that actually helps my clients, my people. Because it's not generally be better, make good decisions and resolutions and stick to them. It forces one to be introspective and soul search into the specifics of their lives. It's based on a timeless, I would say thousands of year old, Kabbalistic psychological system called the Sfirot, the spheres, and specifically the seven attributes that define the emotional spectrum of every person's life. Love, discipline, compassion, determination, humility, bonding, and dignity. In the Hebrew, it's chesed, gvura, teferes, netzah, chayid, yesayid, malchus. And not just these seven, but the way they interact with each other is the key. And he says, so my clients, they have to each have a journal, and it's, it, it, this is not optional. It's, it, it, it's uh, mandatory that they have a journal, and each day, how, is, how are you doing with your love? How are you doing with your discipline? Which brings me back to our discussion here, and that is that it really comes down to understanding yourself. And when you do so, in specifics, then you can work on it. Just to say, okay, you know what? I've been 20, 30, 40 years a certain way. I'm going to change. That's usually too formidable. But when you start breaking down, what kind of character are you? What is your emotional makeup? And where do you stand? Evaluate yourself. So I wrote a book called The Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer that's actually based on the Omer counting 49 days, 7 times 7, during this period in time between Passover and Shavuot. And it became much more popular than I ever expected. Well, based on all of that, I'd like to introduce you to a new series which is founded on this book, which is also an app, my Omer app, and it's called Seven Weeks to a Better You. Seven Weeks to a Better You, where each week we're going to dissect one of these seven emotions with a goal of learning how to soul search, how to be introspective, how to evaluate that particular part of the spectrum of your emotions. And where do you stand in it? Are you strong? Are you weak? Somewhere in between. What can you do to improve it? And each week we will cover one of these seven. 
So I welcome you to this special new series, Seven Weeks to a Better You. Hi, Simon Jacobson here, and I welcome you to a new series, a seven-week series, Seven Weeks to a Better You. Each week, we will take one of the seven emotions on the spectrum that is the structure, the DNA of our very psyche and soul. Seven emotions. Each one has many details within them, and these seven emotions define who you are. So just like when it comes to a physical checkup or a physical uh, a health checkup where you go and see what vitamins what minerals you have what you need what you need to supplement the same thing is with the spirit and the soul and our very psyche some of us are very strong in being giving and loving and kindness but don't know when to stop we're not good at discipline others are great at discipline but don't know when to give so each week we will take one of these seven and address it. This week we begin with week one, seven weeks to a better you. Week one, love. The Hebrew word for that is chesed, which sometimes is translated loving kindness, kindness, giving, love. And is the first because everything begins with love. Nine months in our mother's womb is all about being loved and nurtured and completely being engulfed in the embryonic fluids that cradle us, that shape us, which is why it's so necessary in life, because it's literally like a flower without water, a human being without love will wither, won't have, won't have confidence, will be second-guessing yourself, will be driven by fear. So love is the first driving force. But where do we stand in our love? That's the first question. Well, before we ask that, we have to define what is love. And that's where the distortions come in. Most of our our perception of love comes from where? Our parents. What we saw in our homes. So if it was a very healthy love, that's great, a great model. But if it was not a healthy love, if it was a dysfunctional love, or the love was very distorted, or it was very erratic, that becomes our template, which the rest of our lives we are either emulating or ultimately fighting. That is why it's so vital to go back to this millennia-old system and define what exactly is love. Now, generally speaking, there uh, there are many schools of thought, but generally two schools of thought that I'd like to address. One is the prevalent one, that love is another need. Just as we have a need to eat and to sleep and to drink and and need for oxygen and for companionship, we have a need for love. Love is validating Love provides companionship. Love provides intimacy. Now, of course, love in the broader sense includes siblings and parents and children, but romantic love, finding a spouse, and all that comes with that. But ultimately, it's a need that we must have. Now, no one disagrees with that. As I mentioned, a flower needs water. A human being needs love. And indeed, as I mentioned, nine months that we're in our mother's womb, and then... When we emerge from there, healthy parents will continue to provide continue to provide unconditional love. But if it's only a need, then it becomes another selfish exercise, pursuit. Is there anything more to love than just the need? So here's another school of thought which is vital to our conversation. And this is what we need to be concentrating on this week. What is our definition of love? And then we can say, so where do we stand? based on that standard. And the second school of thought, which is the one I'm going to present and make a case for, is that love is actually not about a need alone. Love is actually transcendence. It transcends your needs. It's the relationship with another that allows you to be greater than just your own parameters and who you are within your own self-contained self-interest and ego. And therefore, it's more about giving than about taking. Is it a need? It's also a need, but it doesn't begin and end with a need. 
And many people function that way. They see love as a need. I'll give because I can take. It's a give and take. Like one person I once asked somebody who was struggling with in a relationship. I said, did you ever hear of the concept of unconditional love? He said, yeah, of course. If she did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then I would give her unconditional love. So first he has seven conditions for the unconditional love. You understand? Because we live in a world of a commercial world, an industrial world, a world of negotiation. What's in it for me? And I'll give you based on that. However, if you introduce another dimension, it's called transcendence. That when I love another, actually their differences is what I embrace. Why? Because they can teach me something I wouldn't know on my own. They can help me experience something I would never experience on my own. If it's the first definition of a need, then it's basically fitting them into your framework. And if there's something they disagree with you, or something that their personality is different than yours, you may tolerate it because you get something in return, but you won't embrace it because it's about me. It's like the guy that goes on a date and he speaks about himself for two hours and then he turns to the woman and he says, okay, enough about me. What do you think about me? So the first two hours of narcissism was he, wants, he speaks about himself. And the second where he thinks he's being benevolent, he's letting her speak about him. What about her? So it's really respecting the space and dignity of another person. That's what it is. And when you think of it that way, now let's do a little report card. And that's the goal of this week's first week of seven weeks to a better you. Where do you stand? If it was a need, I'm sure everybody can describe how much of this need is being filled. But I can tell you you'll never be satisfied because all needs will always be more hungry for more. When you learn about the transcendent dimension of love, it actually becomes something that is a real celebration. It's a celebration of experiencing something greater than you are. It's a celebration of actually experiencing vulnerability. Yes, that sounds odd, I note to many. Many people hear the word vulnerable, they shrink in fear. Why? Because vulnerable sounds weak, sounds like I need to protect myself, defend myself. No, to be with someone you can trust and be vulnerable with is beautiful. So where do we stand in this regard? Now, I know when I define it this way, many people will say, oh, one second. Once you define it that way, I don't know how much of transcendence in my love I have. Yes, I may have a spouse. I may have a family. So however it is, what I suggest is take out a journal, take out a book or a piece of paper, and we're going to make one for each week. This is the first week. We'll call it chesed, love, and we're going to evaluate. Firstly, define what you think is love. I gave two ways of approaching it. What do you think it is? Your instincts. Not what you read. In general, your instincts. You may say, well, I never really thought of it that way. I just, I am what I am. I love as I learned to love from my parents, from others, from people, from life experiences. Define it. And then let's see where do we stand in this regard. If you're a married person and you have a spouse, whether it's a wife or a husband, ask yourself this question. How much of this relationship is about me taking and how much of it is am I I giving? Am I growing through this relationship? Or is it static? Do I embrace? Am I excited about the differences? I may like to read certain books. My spouse may have very different interests. They may not even like to read. They have other, other experiences. Do I find that annoying and irritating? Or do I find that actually an adventure? And there's no right or wrong. This is just an evaluation. But it's a critical one because this is what tells us where you stand. And that's what we want to accomplish this week. You can't improve something if you don't have a sense of where you are. It's like someone running a marathon and they have no idea how far they are from the destination. They don't even know where the destination is and where the point of departure. That doesn't work. It has to be me- measurable. So you know, here's the, the beginning of the, of the marathon. Mile one, mile two, milestones, and here's mile 22. So I know, and then you gauge yourself. There's a beautiful expression by one of the great masters, Hasidic masters. He says, in life, it's critical to know how small you are and how great you can become. There's some people who have 
illusions or delusions of grandeur. They know how great they can become, but they don't know where they stand. There are other people the other way around. They know where they stand and they feel very lowly about themselves, low self-esteem, no self-confidence. They don't know how great they can become. You really need a combination of both. Where are you and where you can go? That's why it's so vital to have a beautiful standard in front of you. It's like when you learn art or music. You teach even a beginner what the classics, what the masters did in their art and their music or any other skill. But not because you may, may, you may never be able to reach that place, but you want to know what is perfection. Of course, in the human life, there's no perfection, but what is close as possible to perfection? It's like you can't, you can't draw a circle if you don't have a perfect circle to juxtapose and see how far am I from the perfect circle. You ever see, for instance, a uh, doctor takes an x-ray of your lungs. I mean, no one should ever know of that, but let's say an x-ray of your lungs. And when they look at the x-ray, they'll place it on a screen near an x-ray of very healthy lungs that are clear. So then you can compare. This is what a clear lung looks like, and here there is, God forbid, a lesion, a blockage, or something that's, that shouldn't be there. You always need the standard. So understanding these emotions are critical. In this case, we're talking about love. What would be the best possible love? And that's the next thing you need to write down. Even if you're not there yet, what do you think would be the highest standard? Now, unfortunately, many of our answers will be inadequate because they're also based on what we think is love. That's why I'm introducing another concept of the transcendence. Can any of us just have total transcendent love without ever feeling, one second, I need something right now? Of course not. But when you understand it doesn't begin and end with needs, it begins and ends with a transcendent experience of something greater than yourself. That's what a real relationship is about. Then it's not just about you. It's not just about the other. It's something that's beyond both of you. While also maintaining and not compromising the integrity of each individual. So love overall is a, an, a deeper experience of life. And what we want to do is evaluate, firstly establish what we consider to be the standard, and then evaluate and say, where am I? From 1 to 10, where do you stand in this element of love? Now, a few other questions to ask about love, because transcendence is the heart and soul of it, but there's more. Do you give easily? Does it come easy for you? Or is it hard? Or you be, are you doing begrudgingly? Some people, it's like pulling teeth. Someone comes over to them for charity. They are always resistant. They're always looking, how can I do the minimal or do nothing? Others are very magnanimous and they just give. They're open-hearted. They don't need to be convinced. Where do you stand in that? Again, from 1 to 10. And there's no right or wrong. You must want to be honest and sincere, integrity, because without that, there's no growth if you lie to yourself or deceive yourself. Again, you want to know where you, where you, where you are and where you can go. We'll get to the going to growing, but first let's do the evaluation part, the diagnosis. We'll call it the diagnosis of this part of the spiritual genome called love, because remember, we're in week one. Okay. Another few questions. When you give, what ultimately happens? In other words, do you know how to give in a way that's a healthy approach to giving? For instance, your child is crying for something, so you just give them, and then you realize you just spoil them, and then you don't know what to do. In other words, where's the discipline within your love? That's the, sec the next step. Do you know there's gas and there's brakes? Love is beautiful, but think of rain. Rain is a great blessing, and it's a form of love. It's a form of, uh, it's a gift. It's a blessing of rain, of water, that waters the fields, that irrigates the fields, and it's necessary for growth and for everything that we consume. But what happens if the rain comes down in a flood? It, what will it do? It can damage the field just as much as a drought can. So the beauty of rain is the rain drops. It, the rain comes down, but they're drops, so they can be absorbed by the ground before the next drop comes. So it's a certain pace. And now if it comes down in a downpour, a deluge, what will happen? It will literally destroy the field. So the key to rain is balance. The key to love is also balance. Where do you stand in the discipline of love? The third question. And if you notice, you'll see I'm going through actually the seven emotions within each emotion. 
So there's the love of love, and now we're talking about the, the, the discipline of love. You see this especially with children, as I mentioned. You want to love them, but you want it to be measured. You want it to be regulated. First of all, not to spoil. Secondly, that they grow from it. And don't, don't have a sense of a of, of false and exaggerated sense of entitlement. The third is compassion within love. Now, what is compassion? Seemingly very much like love. Compassion means that even if a person doesn't deserve love, because let's say they did something wrong, so you think discipline is the way to go. Compassion says, you know what? There's always room for giving a person benefit of the doubt or overlooking something. Not in a way that hurts them. Not in a way that spoils them. Or like I said, will create a false sense of entitlement. So this has to be done wisely. But it's a certain element of compassion, which goes further than just love. I feel for the person. Empathy. Even though love itself seems to be empathy, but you can have love without compassion. And you can have compassion without love, which we'll talk about in week three. So where do you stand in that element of compassion? which is another way of seasoning and directing the love properly. The next question, and again, these are all for evaluation purposes. Then we're going to discuss what you can do in each, with each of these questions once you evaluate it. So if you, let's say you said your number, in number one, you're, very, you're a nine, you give so much. But discipline, you're weak, you're number two. So we know that. So your report card will reflect, your diagnosis will reflect each one of these different questions. Let's go to question number four. Well, it's not really question number four because I posed some questions before, but it's the fourth emotion within love, and that is the endurance, the determination. Many of us are very loving, but when there's a soon there's an obstacle or something happens, we pull back. We don't like confrontation. We think that maybe it may, it may, it may be misunderstood. Love requires a certain determination, a certain consistency. And that's the netzach, that's number four in love. Where do you stand with that? Do you love only when it's easy to do so? What happens when there's a, some challenge? I'm not talking about a challenge that the person did something to you. That goes more into the area of compassion, which I should have mentioned, and we'll go back to that in a moment. But let's finish with this one, with this point. The endurance of it, the, the ambitious drive. You're ready to fight for your love. If, for example, something happens that compromises the love, there was some form of something severed, some, some trust that was bro- breached, obviously you need to correct it and all, but you also have that willpower to want to make it work. And there's no love that does not need that. Let me go back to the third thing with compassion. Compassion is also significant when you've been hurt by the other person. So though that person needs to be accountable, but sometimes we need to have compassion, which means you are ready to forgive. Now, that's conditional, of course, if the person is truly remorseful and it's something that forgiveness will help. If forgiveness is just becoming a pushover and just feeding the other person's uh, abuse, that's not what we're talking about. Compassion is also that ability to get beyond your own comfort zone and say, I'll be compassionate here, even though I may have been hurt. So getting back now to four, we just talked about the endurance. Five is the hoid, which is the, we'll call it the humility, the yielding. In a good relationship, you'll see, even if you're right, sometimes it's good to yield. Don't make a whole big thing of it. Yielding is like the, like it says in the Talmud, the sages say, always be, a person should always be flexible, like a reed, and not rigid, like a cedar tree. When the wind blows, when a storm strikes, anything that's too rigid can break in the storm. Whereas a reed goes with the wind. The flexibility allows it to navigate. And you see any, all healthy people have that resilience that comes from the element of flexibility, of humility, of yielding. Where do you stand in yielding? Are you able to yield? Now, it's interesting, yielding, just like discipline and love seem to be antithetical, but they truly work together well, 
because discipline allows you to channel the love in a proper way, in a way, the yielding counters the drive and ambition. Because some people, in the name of love, they don't know how to let go. They're relentless. How many times, let's say, somebody tells you, a person that loves you and says, I need my space. And you feel, no, I don't want to give you your space. I love you so much, I will keep knocking on your door. And you end up alienating them. So even though ambition, drive, determination is critical to fight for something, but you also have to know when not to fight. Like if your spouse says, I'm upset right now, or I need my own little private space. You'll say, no, we love each other so much, let's be determined. That's misplaced, because that's not respecting the boundaries. There you need to yield and say, okay, I respect that. On the other hand, where does the, the netzach, the determination, the relentless drive comes if something challenges the love, you don't give up easily. But not giving up doesn't mean you in any way, um, uh, what's the word I want to use, in any way uh, suffocate the other person, hover over them and suffocate them. It means I have inside my heart, I'm ready to fight for this, but you have to sometimes respect those boundaries. Sometimes you need to yield. So yielding is not a contradiction, if you really think about it, for fighting for something. Sometimes the way you fight is by yielding. When I say fight, of course, I don't mean a fight in a negative way. I meant to say determined to really make it work. And that's why humility is such a critical component in that. Because the humility checks your drive to make sure it's coming from the right place, not just because you want to win. There's an argument, and you say, I must resolve this argument before we go to sleep. And your spouse says, let's sleep over it. You say, no. So you, your ego can sometimes get in the way. And even though they may be coming from a good, well-intentioned place, but ultimately it's not going to help the relationship. So the yielding, where do you stand in yielding? Number six is bonding. Now this is a very interesting one. Love is a beautiful thing. Look, people fall in love, but what happens after a few years? They suddenly fall out of love. They could even be in a divorce, ugly divorce court. What happened to the love? Because the love was lacking bonding. Not just endurance that we spoke about, bonding. That there's a bond. There's a big mistake in our modern culture. We fall in love. Love at first sight. That's not love. That's like liking someone. That can be an infatuation. That can be a crush. We have it all the time. Teenagers, you start feeling love for your teacher or love for someone. And you think you can't live without it. It's an obsession. That's not love. Love is a mature love where there's a bonding, there's a connection. It's like when you plant a seed in the ground, it's not a tree. The tree of love comes with time, over time, when two people who really care about each other and like each other, and they live their lives, even in the, in the details that are boring, not just in times of fireworks and the honeymoon and excited moments, then they bond. And bonding is a process that you cannot force. It takes time. So where do you stand in the bonding of your love? Do you share a vision together? Have you gone through many things in life and seen the ups and downs? And that made you stronger. Do your differences make you stronger, as we discussed earlier? So the bonding in love is more than just endurance. What's the difference? Endurance means that you have that willpower, the determination to make it work even when there's an obstacle. The bonding is the more long-term connection where you see people become inseparable in a healthy way. Inseparable because they have become so much connected, so they've melded together while still remaining individuals. Where do you stand in bonding? And I will tell you, in our society especially, bonding is one of the weakest because people have not been taught that type of long-term commitment. Things get tough. Divorce is always an option. Even if it's not physical divorce, it's emotional divorce. It's other forms of people betraying their spouse, betraying their partner. Bonding is a tremendously critical component because that's where the real transcendence takes hold. And finally, the seventh question in the context of the seven within love is dignity. If love in any way compromises the dignity of a person, violates the dignity, there's something wrong. I remember counseling a couple where they loved each other, and I would say in all the six previous ones, pretty good. They were with each other a long time. 
but there was one disturbing element which did, took, took me a while to pick up. One of them was more dominant, the other one was more passive, which is good, fine. But no, but the dominant one was in some way abusing, in a subtle form, where it wasn't so obvious that the person felt they were being abused, but they were being humiliated in their relationship. And it's not always easy to discern because someone says, I'm happy with that, especially in their sexual relations. And listen, I'm not here to dictate to anyone how to have their intimacy. But it almost came like the humiliation became part of their experience. And it did spill over. It wasn't just in the bedroom. It spilled over that there was an element of almost a dismissiveness. They would go out to dinner and she would say something and he would like almost dismiss it. And it became known, you know, that she's like she's not as smart as he is. So though the other factors were in place, the dignity, it wasn't making her a more dignified, majestic person. It wasn't building her confidence and esteem. So you see here, you can have all the other six dimensions, the love, the discipline, the compassion, the endurance, the yielding even, and the bonding. But we have to focus on where is the dignity? Do you feel more dignified with your partner? I gave a strong example of humiliation or demoralization. But even on a subtler level, even if you don't feel that, it needs to make you feel dignified. You feel like a queen, like a king. Your partner makes you feel like a king and a queen. Feel dignified, royal. Which really is the essence of when a healthy mother looks and stares at her newborn child. Without even saying anything, just the look of the eyes when they meet is telling the child, I love you unconditionally. You're so special. You're a king. You're a prince. You're a princess. It's a little subtle because it's how do you define it, but it ultimately means that the love is enhancing the very dignity of the individual. And that's the malchus, the seventh. So where do you stand in that regard? Both in how you give love and how you receive it, which, for the record, all the seven questions that I posed, is in both directions, how you give and how you receive. But maybe you should make them two different columns because it's not the same thing. I was really focusing more on how you give. How's your love? Not just how you're receiving. Because that needs to be done with the person who's supposed to be giving you the love. They should be doing that exercise. And maybe some of you listening to this will do it together, which only makes it more enriching. And I definitely strongly advise that because it's very interesting to compare notes. Comparing notes that you may think that you're doing something in love a certain way and your partner tells you, no, you think you're a number 10 in that and I'll tell you you're number one in that. I've seen that many times. But that's an additional component if, that, if the circumstances allow for that. That definitely makes the experience a far richer one in the growth. Now, now that we've established how to diagnose and how to evaluate and come away with some form of a report card, now comes the question, So what do you do about it? Well, I will tell you this. There's an expression. The cure of any problem, half of the cure of every problem is awareness. As soon as you know, let's say, you know, your hand has muscles in it. And you know that you can throw a stone for 200 feet or you can lift up 200 pounds. But right now you're only able to lift 100 pounds. So you know what you need to do. You need to exercise those muscles to build up and condition them to the point that you can lift 200 pounds. Well, you know you can run two miles, three miles. But but you have potential to run five miles, ten miles. So you condition yourself. Once you've established and you've given an actual number, it doesn't have to be exactly, but more or less a rating from one to ten, now you can say, you know what? The things that are highest, I'm not going to ignore because you definitely have to accentuate it and you have to nourish it and you have to strengthen it. But let me look at the things that I'm weakest in. What can I do? If I'm lacking discipline in my love, or I'm lacking any of the others, or not even lacking entirely, but somewhat, so you need a supplement, just like you need a supplemental vitamin. You need exercises that fit. I say, okay, I'm going to, this today, I'm going to do something that's going to include some discipline in my love of my children, or bonding, or dignity, or whatever one of the other, all the seven dimensions we spoke about. And once you know where, there, where, there's a, where there's a weakness, or at least a deficiency, you, you, then you know that you need to put work into it. But it goes hand in hand and also, in also strengthening the ones that you have strengthened. 
because you don't want to ignore that. You want to make sure you build on it. It's just like you may have some muscles in you that are very well working very well and others weaker. You want to work on both. Make the ones that are working well to work even better and the ones that are weaker to supplement, to complement, to find ways to, to improve. Now, here's going to be one of the big challenges. Subjectivity. You may evaluate yourself in ways that are very favorable to you. It would be good to have an independent monitor, so to speak, a mentor, a friend. It could be your spouse if you can get to that point without becoming too critical because a spouse sometimes is too close for comfort. That can help you. Is your evaluation correct? And also, what are the suggestions that you are thinking of doing to supplement, to fill the gap, to see where you can improve any part of your of that part of your love personality and that they can help because when we do it ourselves it sometimes can be distainted and biased and prejudiced by our own subjectivity and self-love and it becomes slanted so just another component that can help you really get there but i can assure you do this you will become a more loving person a more transcendent person the love you give will be far deeper than when you began. It's just the conversation already will improve things. Now, if you find something that's a real block, a real difficulty, you may need some help. You may need to discuss it. I'm not saying everything can just automatically, once you know it, you're going to just correct it. Some things are very difficult. For some people, it's very hard to introduce discipline into their love because it goes against their grain of their nature or their routines or their habits and their patterns. So that's, but at least you know that's what you need to work on. And choose, don't bite off more than you can chew. chew. Choose one thing, two things that you can do during this week. You do have seven days of the week. Each day you can take one of these seven, focus on something and improve. And then at the end of the week, go back to that journal, go back to that page and say to yourself, okay, has this improved? Not, we're not talking about permanently, that will take time. But I can, I, I can say this week, I added a supplemental vitamin C. I added some green vegetables, the, the equivalent in the, in the psycho-spiritual sense. I've added some discipline. I've added some compassion. I've minimized the, the drive and made be more yielding, and etc. So now you have like a second column where you could say it, there's been an improvement. Now, if you really want to maintain this, you keep, on, you keep the journal. And each week you look at these things. We will talk about the other six emotions because each of them have to be addressed. But with this one, you can monitor. And as it improves, just like you want to lose weight, you see the weight going down or you want to increase a certain ma muscle mass or other things. Same thing here. You can monitor yourself. And you could also see when there's a uh, setback or you regress to something, to an old pattern. The key is the awareness and the focus. That will shed a light it's like shining a light on something that you haven't shined a light on you're definitely not going to do anything about it if you don't see it clearly so there my friends is week number one seven weeks to a better you and please join me next week as we cover part two which will be discipline gavura be well and become a better you thank you this has been simon jacobson Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com, where you can find a series of many different pr programs. And of course, this series that will be developing over the next seven weeks. Thank you very much. Be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.